at this time our children. Anybody wants to go to Children's Church, Miss Jamie, Miss Becky, or want to be down there with you this morning, feel free to make your way down the steps. As they're leaving, if you stand with me, if you would, please, for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in uh, several places today, but we're going to start in the book of Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, the 30th verse. Uh, I am reading from and teaching from the, the New American Standard Version of the Bible. If you have King James, uh, NIV, different translation, uh, word can be just a tad bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, in the name of this message this morning, is a few good men. I thought this was a, uh, when I looked at this particular passage of Scripture, it's a pretty bad example for uh, the nation of Israel. Ezekiel 22, 30 said, I sought for, uh, I searched for among them, searched for a man among them who would, would uh, build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But look at the last part about it. I couldn't find any. I didn't find not one. Now think about this for just a minute. Well, let me pray and then I'll go on with it. Father, speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice and yours alone. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Now I want you to think about that for just a minute, that passage of Scripture. And Ezekiel said he searched through the whole country for somebody who would stand up for the land, for a man of integrity that would stand in the gap for his country. <laughs> man who would stand in the gap not only for his country, but for his city. Not only for his country, but for his city, but for the town that he lived in. For the, the rural suburb that he lived in. And ultimately for his family. And Ezekiel said, I couldn't find any. Now this is years after Noah's flood. That God wiped away all those people because of the evil of their hearts. And he said, I look for a man among them, uh, them that should make up a hedge or build a wall. Stand in the gap. But I couldn't find any. Now I believe today we got some men in here today that stands stands in the gap. I believe we got men here today that stand in the gap for their family, stand in the gap for their children, their grandchildren. I can I believe we got men in here today would take a bullet for their family if that's what they're called for. I believe in you guys, and I believe there's a, there's several of you in here today that uh, feel that way about your faith. That if it was time to be uh, counted for, that you would stand in, stand up and be counted for your faith. What about you? Can you say that? It's an interesting question because I think we're coming closer to a place that that may be a very reality. That we'll have to make a decision of whether we stand for Christianity or we don't. It seems, at least anyways, that the train of evil and the things that are going on in the world has picked up considerably, does it not? It seems like there's an acceleration. And to some point, you and I are, are going to be faced with a decision whether we come to a church and, and gather uh, because, you know, the government may not want us to. Not necessarily the federal government, but maybe the state and local government. Or maybe we will be uh, we'll be pressured not to come because of an activist group or or uh, uh, somebody threatening, just like you know we hear about church shootings all the time. We got men that have volunteered in this church to stand in that gap. That while we don't advertise who they are, or, or some of you know, some of you don't, but they're men who just this very morning are, are on security detail for your safety. Now understand what that means. Now you say, now preacher, that'll never happen here. So did everybody else in all the churches across the country that did it happen to. But these men have volunteered to say, I will be the first line of defense. Do you understand what that means? That if somebody were, God forbid, to come with bad intentions, that we have got men in here. Now, if you didn't think it's true, I may be talking to you out and doing it. But you, we got men in here that, uh, that have said, I will stand as the first line of defense for the safety of all my people. Think about that. It's a pretty interesting statement, is it not? That I love you enough that I'll stay outside, I'll stay inside, I'll do what we need to do, but I will be the first line of defense. When I was in the pastor of church in Mount Sterling, I had a little lady sit on the, the second row. She was about 83 or 84, uh, and we were talking about that one Sunday. Uh, I was preaching, I was talking about church shootings and all that. She interrupted my sermon, and she said, Preacher! 
Don't worry about it. If they come in here to do something, said, I got you covered. All you need to do is duck. <laughs> but we need a few good men. Men that will stand and are not afraid uh, to live, to laugh, and ultimately to die. What's the, pre the prerequisite to being a good father? Well, I thought about that a little bit. What does it mean to be a good father? Because we all know that, that maybe some of you have fathers who have not been a good father. And not every Father's Day situation is, is, is a good day for everybody because it brings up memories of a dad who wasn't there, somebody who didn't participate, somebody who didn't show up to, um, uh, to an event or, or show up there in your childhood. I have made a, a, a conscious decision with the life of my children that even though I work two jobs, I try to be in as much as I can. I, got a man, I had a man leave the church that I was passionate at one time because I took a Wednesday night off to go watch my son play t-ball. Now, it wasn't like I left the church without anybody because there were people there filling in for me. But when he cornered me about it, he said, I can't believe that you put your family before God, to which my response was, listen, long after you're dead, I'm going to hopefully grow to be an old man. I got two kids that will determine the length of stay in the nursing home. <laughs> and they will determine which nursing home and quality I go to. So I'm going to take care of them now, so hopefully when I get old and it comes that time, they don't drop me off in Timbuktu and forget that I was ever there. Being a man, functioning as a man, taking responsibility as a man, thinking like a man, acting like a man, working like a man. All of these are prerequisites to being a good father. You will not be a good father until you're a good man. And somehow or another, our country wants to demoralize the biology of manhood. They want you to feel bad that you, if you're a man. Well, I, I want to tell you something. I wake up every morning and look in the mirror and say, hot dog, you good looking thing. <laughs> I do not apologize, nor do I uh, back down for being given what God gave me. He made me a six-foot, hot-look, all-American man. And if the world doesn't like that, too bad, but that's just what you got. Being a man is a dying art today. There's not many in our nation, if you think about it. Thank God that in this facility this morning, we do have good men. But we can always use a, foot, a few more. Ladies, I want to help you this morning before we get deep into the sermon with a man's the uh, thesaurus. Because men don't always say what they mean. Let me ask you a question, ladies. You ever had trouble communicating with your husband? Understanding what he's talking about? If you just raise your hand up, just be honest. Okay? My wife's got both hands up. <laughs> So for your future benefit, lady, I'm going to help you this morning. One man says it would take too long to explain. What he really means is I have no idea how it works. When a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard. Means that I can't hear the game on the sound of the vacuum cleaner. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, he really means, are you still talking? When a man says it's a guy thing, he means there's no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance of, uh, at all of making it logical. <laughs> what a man says, can I help you with dinner? What it really means is why isn't it ready yet? <laughs> what a man says, uh-huh, uh, uh sure, honey, or yes, dear, means... Absolutely nothing. He's been conditioned to have that response. When a man says, you know how bad my memory is, really means that he can remember the song The Hogan's Heroes and the phone, the phone number to the first girl he ever kissed and the vehicle identification numbers of every car he ever owned. But yes, he forgot your birthday. I cannot for the life of me, as I, as I put this together, I was thinking about the Mogus Hero theme when I put this together, but I cannot for the life of me rethink about what it sounded like, and I had no idea who the first girl I kissed was. I don't remember. It was my wife. Had to have been. Because I had forgotten all others. <laughs> Maybe she'll let me 
take a nap this afternoon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. He really means I probably have severed a limb, but I will bleed to death for I admit I'm hurt, so get over here and help me. When a man says, I can't find it, means he didn't, it didn't fall into his outstretched hand, so I'm completely clueless. Uh, <laughs> study, a, a, a study was done of men and women. They put a, a bottle of, uh, 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 say a bottle of mayonnaise in the center of the refrigerator. And they told, they told the men and women to go find the bottle of mayonnaise. It, remember that it was placed right in the center of the refrigerator. When a man walked up to it, every man done this. He walked up to it like he was Johnny Bench. He got down and he began the bobblehead position. <laughs> and nine out of ten men could not find the kit of the bottle of mayonnaise. On the, on the contrary, nine out of ten, ten out of ten women walked to the refrigerator, opened the door, stuck her hand out, grabbed it right in the middle where it was setting, brought it to the man within three seconds. When a man says, I can't find it, means uh, I've done that, but it didn't fall into my astral's hand, so I'm completely clueless. When a man says, I heard you, he means I have the foggiest clue what you just said, and I'm hopelessly, hopelessly desperate, hoping desperately that I can think it well enough so that you'll not spend the next three days yelling at me. When a man says, you know I can never love anyone else but you, he really means I'm used to the way that you yell at me and realize it could be worse. <laughs> Woo, some of y'all in trouble today. When a man says, you look terrific, he really means, oh, please, don't try one more outfit on. We're late and I'm starving to death. When a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly we are. He really means no one will ever see us alive again. <laughs> when a man says, I don't think I can go today. He means shopping is not a sport. No, I'm never going to think of it that way. When a man says, I don't remember saying that, it's because, it's because he means anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all past comments become null and void after seven days. When a man says, that's not what I meant, he means if someone, if something I can, if something I said can be interpreted in two ways and one of those ways make you mad, I meant it the other way. <laughs> when a husband says, honey, what color is this? He means all men see in only 16 colors. This is true. Like Windows default settings. Peach, for example, is a fruit, not a color. Pumpkin is also a fruit, and I have no idea, idea what toupe is. You ever seen that with crayon? T A U P E? Toupe? I have no idea what that is either. Maybe a toupe you wear on your head, a toupe, who knows? Before you can be a good man, you gotta be a good, uh, before you can be a good father, you gotta be a good man. So, what about, what's the characteristics of good men? I'm gonna share with you for just a few minutes. Thought we'd start off with some funny things, but now I want to get serious for just a second. I want to share with you a few things that make a good man. Number one, good men are men who've learned to lean on the Lord. Good men are men who've learned to lean on the Lord. If any of y'all here today have been married and you, you were married before your husband became a Christian, you probably have seen that change that coming to Christ has made in his life. Maybe he was, uh, you know, was hard to deal with, rambunctious, run around, drank, fussed, and cussed, and all those things. But when a man comes to Christ, when he comes to know Jesus, we learn some things. We learn some things about ourselves, but we also learn some things about life in general. And a good man is a man who learns to lean on the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You already know that one since I've been here. It's my life verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And so a man learns to lean upon the Lord. Now we get better at this the longer we practice it, men. So the thing that we need to understand today is that, gentlemen, we're not ever going to be perfected overnight. And most, most young men 
are products of their upbringing. And so what I mean by that is this, is that young women, young ladies, having raised both a boy and a girl, I, I realized the difference between when, when Shandy would get mad, uh, she would break down and cry. When Travis would get mad, he'd blow up and explode. But there's a difference between how we treat men and women. Most young girls, when they cry, we, can't, we comfort them. We put our arms around them and, oh, baby, it's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. It's going to be good. And, oh, you know, we baby her and we, we tell her it's going to be all right. We're going to take care of things. But when men cry, the number one thing that most men hear from, from another man is big, big guys don't cry. Big men don't cry. Wipe the tears away. Don't cry. You know, I don't, uh, that's what sissies do. We don't cry around right here. We're men. The problem with that is this, is that men who don't know early on how to process their emotion grow into young men in their early 20s and 30s that are angry because they don't know how to express themselves when they get the, these things of emotion built up. A woman, she can have a good cry and she's fine. Some of y'all women cry over stuff that doesn't make absolutely any sense at all. But you just start crying. When you get done crying, you're better for it. I can walk into the house and if, if the uh, wife beater channel is on in, in the living room, you know, lifetime television, I call it the wife beater channel. Really, there's only three things that happen on that channel. Somebody's down in cancer, somebody's having an affair, or somebody's beating their wife. I don't know which three on it, but almost every movie's like that. And I've walked in on multiple occasions and watched my wife watching the wife beater channel, and she'll just be over crying. I said, what are you crying for? She said, she's dying of cancer. I said, do you know her? No. <laughs> Men, on the other hand, we bottle up our emotions. We bottle up things. And then finally, when we finally get to the top, we explode and we burst out on anger. And, the, and then when we burst out on anger, who gets the brunt of it? Generally, the people that we love the most. So I tell you that to say this. One, we need to learn to lean on the Lord, but two, we need to learn to express ourselves. It's okay. I tell my, my children, I told my son, it's okay to cry. You're not less of a young man if you cry. You're not less of a person if you cry. If, if it's something that, that moves you, I didn't cry a whole lot till I got children. And then, you know, things, when you get children, you cry more. You just, you see the miracle of life and you realize how fragile it is and you realize that, man, and now that I look back at my Adam as they've grown up, I've got one that's just about to be 21 and one about to be 17, and I'm thinking, I just brought both of y'all home the other day. Where did all this time go? And so we're men, men who are good men, learn to lean on the Lord. They trust in God with all their heart. They lean not to their own understanding. Another thing about men is that we we are we are come to to have all the all the answers to everything that happened in life. Why did this? Why did that? And many times we don't know. We lean on the Lord in those times. So, men, I want to share with you this morning. If you're not where you need to be as a man, and you, you're sitting in here thinking, you know what? I'm not. I'm not. I need to get better. It's a process. You will not be who you need to be overnight. You can get saved today. Come forward, join the church, get baptized, get saved. You begin the process of walking with Christ, but it will take you a lifetime to finally be the man that God's called you to be. A lifetime. Now, I will, I will happily admit to you that at, and now in my late 40s, headed towards 50, I am, I am not nearly uh, blow up as much as I did in my younger days. But in my younger days, I was like every other man in the room. I lost my cool. Matter of fact, I was pastoring our first church. We, had, we were young. I was probably about 23 or 24. Maybe, maybe a little bit younger than that. Maybe 20, 22 or 23. We were pastoring our first church. We lived 50 miles away. We lived in the Lexington Church. It was in Noah County. We were driving to church. We hadn't been married in a few years, and I don't remember exactly what we were talking about that particular morning, but it had to be that she was accusing me of fooling around some other woman. It had to be something to do with a woman or something like that. And we're going down the road, and, and as we're going to the church, I, I lost my cool. And I punched the center cap on my little pickup truck. I had a little white Dodge, or a little white Nissan pickup truck. I punched the center cap of it because I was angry. But when I punched the center cap, you know what happened? The horn was stuck in. And so we go down the road to the church with the horn going, all the way to church. As an announcement of us coming in, here we are. <laughs> Jumped out of the truck. Praise God, we're glad to be here today. <laughs> but we had just thought about things beforehand. 
I don't get as ang- I don't get angry anymore like that. Where you know, most of the time I'll say something, she says something, we move to another room, and then, what'd you say to me a minute ago? I don't remember me. We move on. But young guys, listen, you have got to work on this stuff. We've got to work to be better men, especially in the generation in which we're living. When manhood is being attacked, when, when people say that, you know, it's, it's okay for men to be women and women to be men, and when, when the biblical manhood is, being, is under attack, it's okay to be a man. It's okay to walk like a man, dress like a man, think like a man. It's okay to be you, and don't let anybody tell you that. And if you're not where you need to be, start trusting Jesus in the areas that you struggle with. We, we were, if it had not been for God, we would have been like a lot of other couples. We would have been divorced. Because in the first few years of marriage, we really struggled. And I've often told you about the prayer of mine. I kept praying, God change her, God change her, God change her. And it was only until I quit praying that and started praying, God change me, that things get better. So we got to be men who learn that we've got flaws, we got faults, we got things we need to work on. And it's okay if you're not there. It's okay if you haven't arrived. But what is not okay is to sit on the side of the road and say, this is who I am. This is how I was made. This is the way my daddy was, my granddaddy was. It's just the way it's going to be. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be a person that, that God can use. You can be the knight shining armor to your wife. You might be the ugliest man on the planet. But if you treat your woman good, she'll love you as if you was the best looking thing there ever was. Right, Art? <laughs> That's what you get for telling me how good my message was last week. (laughs) Secondly, we need men who learn to lead. Men that learn to lead. Now, not everybody in the room, I'm talking about being a supervisor, not everybody's going to be a supervisor at work, but every man ought to be a leader. Every man ought to be a leader. Leader, You ought to be a Christian leader on your job. If you're a Christian, you're, you're living for Jesus, you ought to be a leader. You don't have to You don't have to have the title of boss, manager, any of that stuff, but you ought to be a leader. Galatians chapter uh, 5, verse 16, will be on the screen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the design of the flesh. And so we're to lead, we're to lead by walking out in a certain way. The way, we, the, the way we overcome the habits that we have and the problems that we're going through is by walking in a different way, walking according to the Spirit. you got to know what the Spirit says uh, to uh, says how to live. There's, a, there's fruits of the Spirit, fruits of the flesh. We'll deal with those one day. But we, we have to guard our flesh because men, the flesh is what gets most men in trouble. Let's do it carefully. Let's do it quickly. There's been a problem in the last several years in the Southern Baptist Convention in which we're a part of, of uh, where we talked about how bad the Catholic Church was with the Catholic scandals about covering up child abuse and things of that nature. What was happening was we were, we were creating uh, uh, edicts and all this stuff against the Catholic Church while unknowingly to most everybody, there were a group of men in upper leadership at the Southern Baptist Convention were doing the same things except they were exploiting women. It's all starting to come to fruition now. It's all starting to come forward. Why, why, why that? Because the devil will use sex to get you off track. Many men have fallen because they've had an affair. Many preachers in the last three months have become to, to light because they're having an affair. Well, why, why are they having an affair? Because the devil will use your sex drive to pull you off track. Men, if you love your wives, put her first. She's not going to be what she was when you married her 20 years ago. She give you kids. She raised you a family. She probably going to change. The skinny girl's going to get a little, going to get a little, little pudge around her every now and then. Going to get a, she going to get some now. But you going to get a little bit too. And you going to get gray hair and no hair. <laughs> We're all going to change. But if you're not careful, listen to me. If you're not careful, the devil will use that to wreck your life, your testimony. He will wreck. He will use the, the sexual, uh, the, the word sex to destroy your life. 
So we have to guard the flesh. Now, my parents' grandfather was 75 years old, uh, 74, 75, before he passed. We were somewhere together, and his grandson caught him looking at a young girl walking by. He said, Grandpa, I can't believe you're looking at her. And he said, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Temptation of the eyes, right? And every man battles it. Every man. So if you tell you why not, I don't battle that. You do. We all do. We have to get a hold of walking in the Spirit. Because we need to learn to lead. We don't need we not, not only learn to need to lead our flesh, but we need to lead our families as well. I don't know, did I put the Ephesians 5.23 in there? I believe I did. Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. For the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, they got quiet. <laughs> Men, for a husband is the head of the wife. Ladies, for the husband is the head of the wife. But how is he the head of the wife? As Christ is the head of the church. So, how is he the head of the wife? If he's not being like Christ is the head of the church, now here's the thing I would say to you. Everybody looks at that, and feminist women all the time look at it and say, oh my God, he's a, a man's in charge. I don't need no stinking man. Listen, if you had a man that loved you like Christ loved the church, you wouldn't have a problem with that. Because Christ loved the church, the Bible said, and gave himself for it. Washing her white as snow, removing all her flaws and all her problems. That's how Christ loved the church. Men, if we started loving our wives unconditionally like that, they wouldn't have a problem in the world with that. They would say, bring it on. We've got to start working on that. We've got to start, with our wives. We've got to start honoring our wives and loving our wives and and doing all those things so that when we walk in the house, she says, oh, there he is. Headship is not being the boss. Headship is not about being the big boss. It's about loving leadership. God is no respecter of persons. Women are equal in his sight. But the Bible does say that she's a weaker vessel. That's not an insult. Rather, it's a compliment to the woman. She is not less valuable, rather she's more fragile and in need of a strong yet loving leader. Amen. Women are like fine silk. Men are more like corduroy. <laughs> silk and corduroy. Which is more fragile? Which is more valuable? The answer to both is silk. And so love her. Like Christ loved the church. One of the things the kids will tell you if they're honest, that the only time really that I got after them was when they talked back to their mama. You talk to you talk sideways to your mama and all hell's coming at you and I'm bringing it. Because I'm not letting you talk sideways to your mama. I watched your mama almost die giving birth to both of you all and I'll be darned if I'm going to stand by and let you talk to her in any way in my son one time. I said, well, what does it matter to you? I said, son, not only are you talking that way to your mother, you're talking that way to my wife. This will not stand in my house. You will not talk sideways to your mama. If you want to see me lose my stuff, you want to see me get upset, you talk sideways to your mama and we'll see what happens. And so most of them, they know that they, they honor their mother. They, they look after their mother. They talk to her right. Now they might say things when I'm not at the house. But when they do, or at least now when Travis does, they'll say, don't tell that. <laughs> And not only do we need men who learn to lead, we need men who learn to love. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but I do not have love, I become nothing but a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I could get the prophecy... Knowledge, know all the mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all the faith in the world, so as to remove mountains, but do not I have love, if I do not have love, I'm what? And if I give all my possessions to the, feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it, it profits me what? 
We've got to be people that love. Now listen to me. Because here's, here's what has happened in the last several years is that if you disagree with somebody, you don't love them. No, I, listen, I love everybody. I, I, I honestly think I don't hate anybody. Black, white, purple, green, gay, straight. I don't hate anybody. I don't agree with everything that everybody does, but that doesn't mean I hate you. And we can disagree without without hating people, right? I disagree. Me and my wife don't always agree on stuff. We, you know, she's got a different way of thinking things. I got a different way of thinking things. She's got she likes certain she's got certain things. I like certain certain things. She got a dress in her house that makes her look like Miss Roper when she wears. You remember Miss Roper on the Three's Company? She got one of them. I'm not supposed to say that. She's got one. I don't like it. But when she puts it on, I like You look great. Beautiful. Now she won't believe it now. But we've got to learn to love. We've got to learn to put others above ourselves. And we, with our families, we need to tell our families. I'm going to challenge every man in the room. Don't be afraid to tell your children and your family, your wife, your moms, your dads. Don't be afraid to tell them you love them. Now, I know this is a hard thing for a lot of men. Listen to me carefully. I'm almost done. I had a man one time get upset with me uh, because I, I'm a handshaker and a hugger. Now, listen, there's two doors in this in this church. There's a, a hug door and a non-hug hug door. This is the non-hug door. If you want to be hugged, you need to go out this one. This is the hug door. If you come in or out of this door, I'm going to get you. It's something that hug. <laughs> I had a man one time tell me that uh, in the church I was at long before here, he said, I don't care for all this stuff. A man and hugging a man and hugging another. And I said, listen, that's your problem. I'm not hugging you in any other funny way other than I want you to know I love you and I'm praying for you. I want you to have a great week. If you can't handle that, then that's not my problem. Guess what? I'm not changing to suit you. If you don't want to hug, there's two other doors. You can go out find you another door. But if you come this door, you're going to get it, buddy. <laughs> The other thing I want to say, men, we're living in a time, we're living in a day that's unfortunately a disadvantage to all the young men in the room today. It's a very disadvantage. Even in my generation, was a, a big disadvantage. Because our, our grandparents in this room were able to, live, to make it on a one household income. How many of you ladies had the choice. You didn't have to go to work, but you had the choice. You were able to stay at home if you wanted to. In this society, in this day and age, that's absolutely off the table. You don't have anything at all. And so, listen, I keep hearing this a lot from listening at work and people talking and things like that. I keep, listen, keep hearing this, and I want, I want to say this clearly. If you're going to have anything in life at all, and I don't just mean to have nice stuff and have nice clothes, but if you're going to have any money put back to retire and not have to eat alcohol or from a food bank or something, if you're going to have anything, it requires men and women both to work and to work hard. Now, if you're looking for a man that all he does is hug, hugs and cuddles you, and after, all, after a while, he gets old. Well, we, we, we married and we married, we're living on love. You can only live on love for so long. You go to you start getting those bills in, and you go to the go to the uh, uh, electric uh, company when you get an uh, electric bill. And you say, "Well, uh, uh, how are you gonna pay it this month?" Jesus will. They ain't gonna take that. They ain't gonna take. Hey, we're living on love. No, we're gonna have to work. And ladies, if you're gonna have anything, you're gonna have to put up with a hard working man. Just don't. I'm not home a whole lot. I'm not home a lot. I work second shift. She works first shift. Guess what? That means that I only really see her uh, about two days a week. Wednesday when I'm off and every other Saturday when I'm off and then Sunday. A lot of times on Sunday I'm doing something for church and a lot of times on Wednesday I'm getting ready for Sunday. So our time is very limited. But I thank God I want you to listen to me. Thank God that I'm doing what she's working. She's working her tail off. Now, she'll be starting next week working from home, which is a blessing. She won't drive and want to get out the weather and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm thank God for that. But I'm so thankful when I'm working, I don't have to worry about where my woman's at. She knows I'm working to do for my family, to put my family first so my family can have it. We're paying a dollar from college and 
trying to get this boy through high school. It's called pulling together. Lady, if you got one of them guys that do, does that, he works and he provides for you. And yeah, he may not be there all the time to attend everything and every function, and he might not be there to, to watch every little thing that happens. But if he's willing to work and to put the family first to do whatever he has to do to make sure his family's fed, clothed, taken care of, then you hug that guy real tight and tell him thank you. Can I get that amen? I keep hearing this stuff over and over. You ever think about leaving my man because, because he ain't around enough? Honey, if he was around a whole lot, you'd get tired of him. You'd get tired of him. A man was talking to his wife, and after she had done something that he didn't approve of, he said to her, how can you be so beautiful and stupid at the same time? To which the woman replied, God made me so beautiful that you would love me, and he made me so stupid so I would love you. <laughs> Men, this morning we thank you. We thank you for, for being here first of all. I go past on, on Fridays, every, every Friday on my way to work, I go to Russell Cave Road. And at the end of Russell Cave in New Circle, there's a mosque there. And I don't know what in the world they're selling inside of there, but every Friday in the middle of the day, when I'm coming to work at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of men in the middle of the day on a Friday fly coming out of that mosque. They had been into some whatever they do in there, they've been there doing it. Now, I don't know what they're selling, but you'd be darn tooting to get a, a hundred men at a Baptist church if, if they had a free fish fry or we had, we had somebody of a, a stature here. Men, I appreciate you being here. And you need to be here. You are needed. Yes, the women are the backbone of the church. We got no qualms about that. Because nothing will get done in most churches without women. We need men. We need men. Because I would have never been in this position had it not been men teaching me how to be a uh, how to sacrifice. And those two old men when I was a little boy, Paul Ellington and George Hardy, would see me in the front yard playing. And they were going. They walk over to the church at Chelham and said, "We're working on something." Come on, boy, you ain't doing nothing but act stupid on the front porch. Come on over here. We're going to teach you how to be a volunteer and how to work. And that's where I learned volunteer service work. Men, we love you. We thank God for you. And if you're a hard worker and you're doing it, I want to give him an extra hug today. Thank him for this contribution. You two may be pulling together. You had your son to get your hug and kiss. Now give him his. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Let's stand our feet. What a wonderful thing it would be today to do one, one thing, and I'm going to ask you one thing only. What a beautiful thing it would be for all the women in this room who have a man, flaws and all. You might be looking at him this morning, you come in here, you had an argument before you got in here. You might be sitting here thinking, I, you know what, I, when, I, when I got, I thought I hit the jackpot and I woke up and I, you know, I'm married to somebody, I don't know who he is now. Do me a favor. You pray for him. You pray God change him and make him who he, who, he, who he was called to be. So our invitation this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, everybody looking around, what it would be like for women all across the room coming and praying and asking God to make that young boy you're holding a hand with, that son of yours, that husband of yours, to grow them into young men of character, men who who matter, men who make a difference, men who lead, men who teach others the way of Jesus, men who are not afraid to do what it needs to be done to be a man, to take care of his family. If he's tired, he's been working, you pray to God, give him strength to do what he needs to do. God, let us not take him for granted. Father, speak to our hearts in this room this morning. It's Father's Day. It's great to say Happy Father's Day, and it's great to, to do, give gifts and all that, but what greater gift can we give than falling on our knees before God? God, bless this man of mine. Bless this child of mine. Help him grow into a man that you've called him to be. Father, we just ask that for all the men in the room as we're here today, 
We know our flaws. We know the things we struggle with. We know the things that we deal with. We don't tell our wives. Because we don't want to worry them. We don't want to get them started on us. All those things. We know where we're at and where we need to be. Help us this day to make a decision that I'm going to be the man that I'm supposed to be. And I'm going to start the journey right now. It's doable. We just got to want to do it. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Every head bowed, every